Another planet that can't be explained by evolutionary models, and a mailbag bursting at the seams. This is Genesis Week. And a welcome to this episode of Genesis Week, the weekly program of creationary commentary on news, views, and events pertaining to the Origins controversy, made possible by you, the supporters of CORE Ottawa, Citizens for Origins Research and Education. Airing on the Miracle Channel in Canada, The Walk TV in the US, satellites all around the globe, and of course, the Chris Cinema Network on YouTube, ChrisCinema.com, Christian Cinema at its finest. Excellence in pirate broadcasting, we took over an abandoned igloo here in Northwest Territories so we could continue to bring you the information the anti-creationists don't want you to see or hear, and giving glory to our creator while doing it. We here at Genesis Week believe your brain was intelligently designed, and God wants you to use it. Remember, if you get lost in cyberspace, you can just punch in wazulu.com or genesisweek.com and you can find us. And also subscribe to our YouTube channel to get extras like Crevo Rants and full interviews with our guests. I'm your host, Ian Juby. University of Arizona posted a press release with the fun title, UA Astronomers Discover a Planet That Shouldn't Be There. <laughs> you know I can't pass up articles like that. Led by a U of A graduate student, an international team of astronomers discovered an exoplanet, that is, a planet outside of our solar system, which was 11 times Jupiter's already astronomical mass. But the real surprise was that it was in orbit around its star 650 astronomical units. Now, an astronomical unit is the average distance between the Earth and our Sun. So, this exoplanet is in orbit 650 times farther out from its sun than Earth is from its own sun. Now, as we've discussed at great length in previous episodes of Genesis Week, all stellar evolutionary models fail miserably to explain even our own solar system, let alone others. Now, many of these problems are simply man-made problems, because the man that made them was assuming that the universe was billions of years old. And so when the solar system and universe doesn't line up with billions of years, it's considered a problem. Now, the only problem is the assumptions of deep time and the theories of stellar evolution, which are clearly falsified. For example, Enceladus, one of Saturn's moons, is giving off 10 times the amount of heat it receives there is so much heat produced that the moon is jetting out geysers some 250 kilometers in height. Besides the mystery of the heat, the next obvious problem is that it simply cannot maintain either the heat nor the jetting out of so much material for billions of years. The problem vanishes if you remove the assumption of deep time and simply acknowledge that the moon is young. But, like comparing a campfire to a small thermonuclear device, Enceladus is nothing compared to Jupiter's moon Io. Now, ten years ago, creationary physicist Wayne Spencer was pointing out the incredible volumes of heat giving off by Io, and its obvious problems for the assumptions of deep time. Io is giving off so much heat that it is even spewing molten lava from volcanoes at 300 kilometers an hour and 200 kilometers high. Loki is one volcano on Io. That one volcano is more powerful than all of Earth's volcanoes combined. The problem here is that Io obviously cannot be emitting such vast quantities of heat for billions of years. As Spencer shows in his paper, the problem vanishes if the moon is simply less than 10,000 years old. All attempts to explain even our own moon have failed miserably. There is no known natural process 
by which Earth's moon could be formed. There isn't even a theory that stacks up to the evidence. Everything about Saturn's rings show that they are young, less than 10,000 years old. There's virtually zero space dust on the rings. Some of the rings are even braided in a complex orbit. The chunks that make up the rings are all different sizes, but millions of years would abrade them down to one homogeneous size. There is no working model to explain the formation of the rings to begin with, let alone the formation of Saturn itself. Now back in 1984, now getting on to 30 years ago, creationary physicist Dr. Russell Humphreys built a model of planetary magnetic fields which was based on the biblical model of a young universe and a young creation. He suggested that when the creator created the planets, that magnetic poles of all of the atoms making up the planet would be aligned. And thus the planets, when first created, would have a very strong magnetic field. That field would weaken over time, and so the larger the planet, the longer its magnetic field would last. Now, Earth's magnetic field is weakening, and we've been able to measure this weakening. In fact, examining archaeological artifacts as well as magnetic fields stored in the rocks of the rock record, Humphreys was able to map out the astonishing variations of the magnetic field with wild reversals at the time of the flood. And get this, a 50% increase in the strength of the magnetic field at the time of Christ. The Creator influenced his creation in ways we would not comprehend when he visited planet Earth in the form of a lowly human being. Taking everything into account, he was able to pinpoint an age of Earth's magnetic field at spot on 6,000 years old. Read the research yourself. This all fit in with his model which successfully made multiple predictions for the magnetic fields of other planets in our solar system as well. Now based on that model, Humphreys made six predictions in writing in Creation Research Society Quarterly back in 1984. Now further research and discovery since that time has verified five out of six of Humphreys' predictions and simultaneously mystified all evolutionary models and predictions. None of those discoveries of planetary magnetic fields were predicted, nor expected, nor even explained by evolutionary theories. We will find out about the sixth prediction in 2015 when the New Horizons spacecraft finally reaches Pluto. So is it really that much of a surprise then to read the press release by the U of A regarding this latest discovery of an exoplanet orbiting, or orbiting at a ridiculous distance from its sun. This system is especially fascinating because no model of either planet or star formation fully explains what we see. In our case, the mass ratio is more than 100 to 1, she explained. This extreme mass ratio is not predicted from binary star formation theories just like planet formation theory predicts that we cannot form planets so far from the host star. Evolutionary planet, star, and solar system formation theories have failed in all of their predictions and even in their explanations for our own solar system. So why are you still trying to beat the evidence with your theories, which have so obviously failed? Meanwhile, Creationists are just sitting over here, just explaining what we see and even predicting what we will see decades in advance of what we go and discover. All because their model is simply the truth. It ain't hard when you have the correct paradigm. The universe is young. It's that time of year again, there's no other way to put it. Television is just plain expensive. And this program does cost money to produce. Even though I pretty much produce the program for free, there are airtime and production costs. Please do remember that Genesis Week is a viewer-supported program and consider an end-of-year donation to keep the program running. Now, sadly, we can only issue tax-deductible receipts to Canadians, but foreign donations can be made online on my website or simply mailed to Cora Ottawa. The address does appear again at the end of the program, and thank you all for all of your support. This has been an incredible year and we look forward to many more episodes. And there are many, many other ways that you can support the program. 
prayer is a huge one. You have no idea how much prayer I need. So please do pray for the program and myself as the primary producer. You can also share the program with your friends and family, either via YouTube. You can click on the share button down below each program and share it on TwitFace Plus. Or as <laughs> so many have requested, episodes of Genesis Week will now be available for instant digital download on my bookstore page for $3 each as I get them added. So you can burn them to DVD or load them onto your tablet, iPhone or iPad and share them with your friends and family that way as well. Stick around, we'll be back in a minute with the mailbag. The Complete Creation video series is just that, an exhaustive look at the science, philosophy, and theology behind the creation-evolution debate. In this 12 DVD series, Ian Juby starts off with a one-hour presentation for the children in God's Little Creation. He then follows up with almost 11 hours of lecturing for the adults as he walks you through the debate starting at its surprising history and examining the evidence from biology, geology, physics, paleontology, and archaeology. Chances are any question you have about the creation-evolution debate is answered in this video series. With open captions for the hearing impaired, the series is both entertaining and educational. There are also free resources such as question and answer and proctor sheets for homeschoolers. You can now get the entire set as an instant digital download or on DVD. Visit Ian's Bookstore today. the one. East Vietnamese jumping spider. The venom is so strong that one bite can kill any child and 95% of adults. The surviving 5% typically slip into a coma for three to six months only to wake up with permanent paralysis. Hmm. Gabe King tweeted a response to our Noah's Sons episode 12 from a few weeks back. A prophecy yet saw your tweet get answered on Genesis week. Mr. Juby seems to gloss over genetics and deal purely with genealogy instead. <sighs> Considering the extent of the peer reviewed papers I specifically cited and provided conveniently in the description of the video on YouTube, papers which exhaustively cite even more peer reviewed papers, one can hardly say that I glossed over the subject. I'm not about to sit here and read entire papers on the show. That would be boring and would be a complete waste of everybody's time because they can look up the papers further in depth reading themselves. So please read the papers first, then we discuss whether or not the subject has been glossed over. Longtime viewer and YouTube critic Nicole SD wrote in, there are no differences between Denisovans, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens. We are all humans? Interesting. Ever heard of the Liger? Care to tell me that there are no differences between tigers and lions? Yeah, they are both felines, but so are jaguars and mountain lions, but you don't see them interbreeding. Denisovans, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens are not all human. They are all apes. Okay, let's try this again because apparently Nicole SD missed the point. For those of you not familiar with it, Ligers are the cross between a lion and a tiger. They are generally an infertile hybrid animal. In other words, we do not see a population of ligers and for a reason. On the other hand, the Denisovans, Neanderthals and Homo sapiens all have a huge population that they interbred with. A population which is still around today, the human race. By definition of the word species, because they interbred and obviously had fertile offspring. That makes the Denisovans, Neanderthals, and Homo sapiens all the same species. Now, if you want to argue that they are all apes, then why is it that chimps and humans cannot reproduce? Even though there was plenty of immoral and illegal experiments to try and produce a chimp-human hybrid, they all failed miserably. So yeah, if you want to call humans apes, go for it. But calling something an ape does not make it an ape. YouTuber Hua Sunshine wrote in, 
Great job, Ian. This may be my favorite episode thus far. Fascinating is all the legend and lore that verifies the historical accounting. How many witnesses are necessary for the world to believe that which is plain as the nose on its face? What more do they need? All the evidence, witness accounts, and even a well-kept log of events should be enough to incriminate God as the premeditated author of this universe. Powerful research, very detailed, great video. Looking forward to your Noah's Flood DVD. Another great video, Ian. Thanks for all you do. Another Ian wrote in from Ottawa. Hey, Ian, great episode as usual. I know that I was one of those individuals who gave you the pig, chimpanzee equals humans article. I do have to say, though, I think the elephant in the room was missed. I do agree that the homology argument is useless. However, there was one aspect that totally debunks the idea of human beings being hybrids between chimpanzees and pigs. A pig cannot reproduce with a chimpanzee. Well, thanks for writing in, Ian, but this is the problem I ran into with Enrique's comments a few weeks back in criticism of Dr. Jeffrey Tonkin's article on the alleged fusion of two chimpanzee chromosomes into one human chromosome. Enrique's first comments, which was what I had and what I had sent to Dr. Tompkins, simply brought up multiple points which were actually specifically addressed in the paper. Dr. Tompkins could understandably only come to one conclusion. Enrique had not read the paper. Now, while Enrique posted some specific criticisms towards the paper at a later time, points which we will address on a future program, until then he had only brought up points which were actually addressed in the paper. Now, the same thing has gone on here with Dr. McCarthy's writings. If you had read McCarthy's writings, you would find that he specifically addressed the claim that it was impossible for a pig and chimpanzee to reproduce. He cites multiple examples of known cross-species reproduction, complete with fertile offspring. And this is, of course, Dr. McCarthy's area of expertise, hybridization. Now, if you wish to dis disagree with his claims, that's a whole other ball of wax. But just saying that a pig cannot reproduce with a chimpanzee unfairly ignores everything McCarthy has taken the time to explain and argue. And so this is why I did not argue that point, but instead focused on the interpretations that McCarthy dove into, because it is the interpretations that gets him into trouble. Now, I do have to agree, though, it would be pretty simple experiments to try and hybridize, hybridize a chimpanzee and a pig. Several evolutionary critics have already called upon McCarthy to prove his case by experimentation. Well, if it happened once, then it could happen again. And I have to agree with him on that point. <laughs> I received two notes of interest relating to the same topic this week. Josh wrote in from Oklahoma. Mr. Juby, I have a question. The critics always say that the Hebrews copied from other flood stories, such as the Epic of Gilgamesh, in order to get the flood account in Genesis, and that the Epic is older than the Noah flood. What do you think? Thank you for your answers. And in perfect timing, the moral troll tweeted on Twitter, I'm sorry to burst your bubble, but Noah was a polytheist that went by the name of Utnapishtim. Well, thanks for writing in, guys. First of all, let's explain what the Epic of Gilgamesh is. The Epic of Gilgamesh is a mythological poem written on tablets, and one part of the epic refers to Gilgamesh meeting an immortal man named Utnapishtim, a man who became immortal after building a ship to survive the great flood that killed all of mankind. He also brought relatives and all species of animals on board the ship as well. His ship landed upon a mountain and he released some birds to find land. Now the parallels with the biblical flood of Noah are obvious. And because the age attributed to the tablets is older than the written Bible, it has been suggested that the Bible merely stole the story of the worldwide flood from the Epic of Gilgamesh. Now, there are numerous things wrong with this theory, as well as some hidden assumptions. The biggest hidden assumption is such skeptics assume there was never a worldwide flood. If there had been a worldwide flood, then the Epic of Gilgamesh is just another one of the hundreds of legends, myths, and historical records around the world of the worldwide flood. Pretty simple. <laughs> so the first and most obvious problem with the Moses stole Gilgamesh's story story is that it was perhaps the other way around. The author of the Epic of Gilgamesh simply made his own fictionalized tale of actual events 
People do this even today. The author simply wrote their version of a well-known story of a worldwide flood. As we've mentioned previously, over 250 cultures worldwide have record, legend, or myth of a worldwide flood in which a scarce few people were saved on board a floating vessel. So why focus on the epic? Just because it is so old? Well, even the most liberal of scholars acknowledge that the epic of Gilgamesh is mythological. The historical record of the flood would have been passed down for generations verbally before Moses ever penned it. So it is just as likely that the biblical version of the Great Flood is actually older than the Epic of Gilgamesh. Furthermore, if you want to argue that the biblical account was stolen from the Epic of Gilgamesh, well, why not explain all of the records around the world as a result of copying the Epic of Gilgamesh? You know, the 250 cultures around the world that have record of this worldwide flood? Did the North American Indians get a hold of one of the tablets of the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in cuneiform? Did they then translate it, modify their story, and add it to their legends passed on from generation to generation? Hmm? Obviously, the argument gets really outlandish really quickly. The simplest and most obvious explanation is that there was a global flood, and all the cultures of the world diverged from these scarce few people who were saved on board the ark. And the biblical record of Noah and the flood is the only record out of all of them that is plausible, as all of the others have obvious mythology invoked. Now what's really interesting in the Epic of Gilgamesh is the mentioning of Utnapishtim being immortal. See, when you lay out a chart of the ages of the people before and after the flood, you'll notice that human lifespans dropped dramatically after the flood. But the people who survived the flood still lived an incredibly long time. In fact, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob could all have spoken with Shem, a person who was actually on board the ark. In the meantime, while Noah and his sons continued living for hundreds of years after the flood, People born after the flood were dropping dead like flies right, left, and center. And so, false religions were started, with Noah and his family worshipped as immortals, because they never seemed to die. Vishnu the fish god is another classic example of mythology of a worldwide flood. Noah's name was sometimes written Nu or Nuwa, and you can see it in both the name of Vishnu or Noah the fish god, as well as Manu, the man Noah, who was saved from the great flood with his family, as well as the grains and animals of the world aboard the cosmic egg. Noah and his family were deified by post-flood peoples, and legend and mythology now surrounds them. And was all because of their seeming immortality. Now, it wasn't immortality at all. They just lived a really long time. But Jesus Christ offers you eternal life today and a warning of the second death for those who refuse eternal life. Noah and the ark were a symbol of things to come. The ark being symbolic of Jesus Christ, who is free salvation from the judgment to come. Uh, in fact, one viewer wrote in, Hey Ian, you say, Will you be like those who did not listen to God's warnings, did not accept his gift of salvation, freely provided for them, and thus were destroyed when the rest of the earth was destroyed? When comparing the flood with the fiery destruction to come, what scriptural reference can you provide to corroborate this idea of warnings and offering salvation to any person other than Noah and family? Excellent question. As the Apostle Peter points out in 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20, Christ actually preached through Noah to those who were now in prison. God patiently waited for those people in the days of Noah while the ark was being built. Those people did not respond and thus received the judgment they were warned about. Though the people were warned, the day came when God himself closed the door on the ark, sealing the fate of both those inside the ark and those outside. Christ has warned of the great white throne judgment to come. He will return as a thief in the night, when everyone least expects him to return. And like the door on the ark, judgment will be here. What side of that door will you be on? 
Will you be one of the ones who are expecting and hoping for Christ to return? Knowing that it means your salvation and entrance into the new heaven and new earth and eternal life? Or will you dread it, knowing that it means facing the judgment you scoffed at or ignored, putting it off day after day until it actually showed up one day and took you off guard? This world, this creation, has become corrupted by sin, disobedience to its creator. As a result of sin, sickness, death, and disease have become a part of this world. As a result, the Bible tells us our creator will make a new earth and a new heaven and this one will be destroyed. Obviously, he cannot allow even one drop of sin into the new heaven and new earth, or else it too will become corrupted. But how then can any of us enter in? Every one of us has sinned. That is why Jesus created a human body to live in on this world, to live a sinless life. He then took the punishment for our sins. Like an innocent man standing in the courtroom where you were just convicted of a crime punishable by death. And that innocent man offers to take your place so you can go free. Jesus offers you eternal life. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that he died and shed his blood for you. That you may be cleansed of your sins and found worthy to enter in to the new heaven and new earth. He said, you must be born again which is just simply believing on Jesus, admitting your sins to him, and asking him to forgive you of your sins, and believing that he died in your place, then living your life in his place here on earth. Why don't you do that today? Well, I gotta call that a wrap. I'm your host, Ian Juby, saying ta-ta for now. And thank you for watching Genesis Week. I hope you'll join me again next week. Remember, you can send us in your comments, questions, and hot news tips to us in a number of ways. You can email us at comments at genesisweek.com or you can send us a tweet at genesisweek. Or you can go to genesisweek.com, which is our YouTube channel, find the most recent show and post a comment there. Or you can hack into our Facebook page and leave a comment at facebook.com slash genesisweektv. Remember those words of warning and comfort from our creator, the Lord Jesus Christ, who said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. We'll see you next week. We are a viewer-supported program and need your support to keep this program on the air. Please pray for us, and if you wish to financially support the program, Canadians can make a tax-deductible donation to CORE Ottawa, Canada North Post Office Box 72075, Ottawa, Ontario, K2K 2P4. While we cannot offer tax-deductible receipts outside of Canada, donors wishing to financially support the program can do so online at ianjuby.org donations, and thank you for your support. Thank you.